Yo, it's the mic on mic and turn that mic on mic and pour us another one let's do it right though mic we feeling nice though mic gather round gather round and turn that mic on mic and turn that mic on mic yeah garage drinks with mic Woo. you sound great you sound great yes Sweet. Barbara Alva, welcome yes. to the garage. Oh, yes. I got oh, you. I got my coffee. coffee first. Yeah. My mocha. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you feeling? Uh, nervous, as I you know, can see. So <laughs> nervous. <laughs> yeah. Breathe. Well, it didn't help that I was, um, that I went to the wrong house. <laughs> it definitely didn't help that you went to the wrong house. But look, the first time someone's done that. Oh, really? Oh, that's my cool. God. That's yeah, cool. There's always that. Did you that turn one. up knocking on the door? Yeah, and I had one a lovely old lady come out. And I was like, that does not look like Mike, but hey. I know, I know which house you went to. Yeah. She's lovely. Yeah, yeah and she I was think, like, oh, no, no, no. I think you're going to this house. And then she I think you're lucky, actually, because I think she's got dogs. Huh? I think she's got, she's got dogs. She's got dogs? Oh, yeah. okay. So, no, no, it was good. Lucky. Like, yeah, don't have my purpose spray. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right that's right hey thank you so much for coming yeah i'm glad that we finally sorted this out yes it's been a long time right it's been a long time since you and i've caught up i think it's yeah. been quite a few years actually yes no no definitely i, I feel like probably five plus years yeah a lot yeah. of time has passed it's weird though because um, i follow your journey like, oh. i see i see what you get up to and stuff and yeah yeah actually quite proud of like oh. <laughs> of you and what you've done and your success yeah. and from when i knew you back at ludus yes um to the person that's sitting across the table from me yes um, so that's why i thought it was quite important to get you on as well because um, i love your story yeah um, you have quite a strong story Ooh, <laughs> give me shivers. <laughs> all good, man. It's all good. Um, I think um, I think probably um, a lot of people that come on here um, probably get like yourself get a bit nervous because you not anticip- can't anticipate like what's going to be asked of you or like you know. Yeah. And it's also um, for a lot of people, especially our Pacific Island community mm-hmm. and our Maori community as well. Um, but they are um, they're quite naturally quite humble people, so it's not the easiest thing to get them to talk about themselves. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's good. That's why I'm here yeah. to guide to guide you through. Get you know, it out of it. Just hell all yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. No, no, that's awesome. Um, so you listened to Fee's podcast? Yes, yes, I did. She's Isn't awesome. she insane? She's, she's insane. She's, she's something else, man. Like, she, yeah, she is definitely somebody that um, you know. Um, so I'm in the police force. Mm. She's definitely somebody that I looked up to before I joined. Right. And um, another thing that I looked up to with her is her sporting career. You yeah. know, um, I myself is quite active. Um, yeah. I love my sports, you know, yeah. I'm really competitive. And she's definitely one of the big role models that I, you know, put in my top of the list that I look up to and um, also kind of go to when I need guidance or support. Just just watch her stuff. Um, she's amazing at what she does. So it it's awesome um, and a privilege to be at a platform where she was once at. And, you know, I had to watch, re-watch her videos before coming in so I can kind of get some questions and, you know, <laughs> I'll be like, okay, okay, I got it. I got the thing it. about her is that she's real unassuming. You know, oh. like if you didn't know her, because she comes to our gym, she's at our gym all the time and I train with her. But if you didn't know her, you wouldn't necessarily know who she is or what she does in the community or what her sort of background is. Yeah. Yeah. Until she gets on the floor. Yeah. And then it's just like you've just released an animal from a cage. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's non stop. It's just non stop. It's like um yeah, she just won't stop. Yeah. And she doesn't it doesn't matter who's training with her. It yeah. doesn't it, it, seriously, if it's me, it could be anyone else. Yeah. She just won't stop. She just won't back down. Yeah. Until it's, until the decision's <laughs> finished. And then it's like then she's smiling again. <laughs> it's like a a different person, but when she's when she's on, she's on. Yeah, yeah. No, I I follow her, so I watch a few of her stories and um it was awesome to watch her transition from um, you know, not playing um rugby mm-hmm. and transitioning into lifting and getting into this community of um getting active getting out there so as soon as i saw that i was in there fire emoji fire you know just like supporting her so no no um definitely you know happy to see that and just loving it just loving all these journeys that i get to see and um thanks to instagram and you know stories Mm -hmm. you don't see people like yourself but um you see everybody's stories and you feel like you're just going through this motion of their journey as Mm. well and um you know every everybody's navigating their own story and then Mm. you know you find yourself navigating your own because of what they're doing and what they're portraying as well so um 
it's awesome to have that platform and it's also that we are able to reconnect from mm. that as well so yeah something i didn't know about you that is actually similar to me is i don't realize that you actually were born and raised over in samoa yes and um, yeah yeah that's, no. that's amazing so tell me <laughs> tell me where your village is in samoa uh yes so uh my dad is from salilonga and my mom is from falealupo so i'm a savai girl i'm right. way back out back um yeah i grew up and moved over when i was eight years old when you were eight years old eight years old little mini mini me um yeah, right. coming over in the big world um yeah it's you know the similar you know polynesian story of coming over for a better future for your family um i came over stayed with my auntie so this is my mom's sister uh parents stayed back in the islands so what do your parents do um at, oh so both my parents have passed away so right now uh it's me and my younger siblings and grateful and lucky and very blessed to have my aunties and i'm uncles sorry there. i didn't know that i'm yeah. sorry yeah i know a lot of people don't it's not yes, something that yeah, you know you no. go out and you, yeah. you talk about until yeah. they they bring it up so sure. um with myself obviously with my journey and my story um that that's a that's the biggest you know how when you have how do you say it? these moments what's the word um, well, things happen in your life yeah that, that are the biggest driving force that push yes. you yeah. <laughs> there you go this is why you're here mike <laughs> but um no that i can, that I was can, a, I can imagine i can that imagine was it. Right. so um yeah um going with my parents um so mum passed away about 13 years ago giving birth to my little sister so oh. she if people that followed me on my how platform, old were you at this know, time i was oh 15 ouch 15 years old still young mm. oh how many siblings do you have um three so two younger brothers and one little sister so i'm the eldest eldest of mm. yeah, four and then um and then my dad passed away three years after mum left and i think it was just um yeah you know i think he he lost the love of his life and heartbroken yeah he mm. he, he was yeah but um i'm sorry to hear that but that's okay um it's a tough age as well so you're 15 and then eight, and then at 18 yeah which is um you know you're a teenager Teen, and so you're yeah. going through all these other things as well and you're in new zealand which is mm. a crazy country as it is especially if you come from samoa yeah. and to have that on top of you as well is um yeah. yeah that's that's not the easiest no no but um no it's you know i i am grateful that i had to go through that because it I had to grow up real quick, you know. At that point, at 15, I was just like, you know what, you don't think for yourself anymore. You think for three other people. And obviously, you know, with mum and dad going, mm. it's you, you, you start to have all these responsibilities and all these things on your shoulders and you just can't help it. Mm. You know, um, I'm sure a lot of, you know, us go through these, you know, our own mm. journeys and stuff and we go through life decisions and we take it on. So from that point on, I was just telling myself like, you know, it's just something that you just have to go through. Um, everybody sure. else have their own, um, you know, things that they have to go through. I didn't think of myself any, you know, oh, this... Poor me. Yeah, yeah you yeah, know, I didn't yeah. I didn't think of myself of, oh, you've got it worse or, you know, you've got all of this. And I was just thinking, you know what, somebody else has their own journey and they're probably going through the same thing. So what makes you think you can't handle this? So How close were you with your mum? Very, okay. very close, very right. close. Um, I was, but I was daddy's little girl. Wow. I was daddy's girl. So okay. um, for those that know me, I'm quite outgoing. How come I just died? Just die as many times. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't die again. Um, but you're telling me, yeah, you're quite close with your mom. Yes, yes. So you, when you came over when you were eight, did you come over by yourself? Or did you come over with like your other siblings? Uh, I came over with my other cousins. So this was, okay. yeah, you know, first yeah. cousins. So there was three of us all together. They right. were like my... They, you know my older sisters so i was the youngest out of the us three um and then obviously when mom passed away we went back and got my brother that was after me yes um the other two still stayed back okay and then when dad passed away we went back and got the rest and everybody back here in new zealand so now we're all here you know very lucky um and very grateful for my aunties and uncles who pretty much just you know took on that role for us um it, they didn't choose this they didn't choose to have extra four kids you know they had their own families but they they opened their arms and say hey you're you're our, you're our own as well so very very grateful for for them my aunties and uncles um and lucky that we were able to come together you know with a lot of um pacific islander families a lot of 
kids do get to, you know, we all get separated or so, you know, mm. siblings. And then I guess it's not until you become an adult that you start reconnecting with each other. Mm. So um, you and your siblings are all here now in Auckland? Yes, we all stay in Auckland. How old is your youngest uh, sister now? 13. 13. Yeah. Um, sorry, what's the age gap between you two? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, it's about um, 15 yeah yeah so it, it, it's, it's but a you're kind of like her mom yeah pretty much yeah. Um, I think a lot of times she looks at me in that way in that yeah. sense um, and oh my god but um, it's all good I got tissues yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> see it's this is why you have to it's okay um, she looks at me in that way but it's it's a huge honour to be a mum you know um, but also it comes with a lot of responsibilities mm. so um, with her and everything that I do um, she's the biggest drive now you know um, a lot of us Pacific Islanders we look at our mum and dad you know when you graduate when you play a game um, when you get an award you get the top and you, the only two people you look for is mum and dad right mm. um, so that's hard I, yeah. I can appreciate that oh, God. but um, yeah for me she's, she's definitely my um driving force for that so yeah god mike this is supposed it's to okay. be happy. <laughs> it's okay it's okay my father passed away when i was 10 yeah when i was yeah. 10 um and we literally put him in the ground on my 11th birthday oh wow and i was the eldest son and from there to from my sort of my teenage years was quite different because i stayed in tonga until i was uh, 16 17. oh wow yeah um but it falls a little bit different on your shoulders. Does you just have this um, feeling of like expectation on yeah. you, whether people put that on you or not? Sometimes children can put that on themselves. Um, it is very special being a mother. Um, but like as a father, I can I can tell you that it's um, like it's definitely of course it's special being a father. But I always understand though that I'm raising other people. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm raising my children. I love them. They're my babies, but I'm also raising them to have their own, have their own, make up their own minds, make their own yeah. decisions in life. Because um, I don't want them to always cling to me all the time and <laughs> always like be stuck to me. You know. Yeah, yeah. And so I think um, <laughs> you take it on quite a lot. Yeah. Like, you, take, you take it on quite a lot, and that must weigh quite a bit on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can imagine mentally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, everything, you know. Yeah. Um, so who do your, sorry, who do your siblings stay with here in Auckland? Uh, so they stay with my auntie. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So they and she with. also has her own children as and well. And she also has her How own How many children. children does she have? She's got three, three now, three young ones. What's you your know? auntie's name? Marietta. Marina. Ma- Marietta. Marietta. Marietta Alva. Yeah, yeah. So she's looking after my little sister um obviously with me and my brothers we're, we're old enough so we all kind of live independently right um but before marietta took over um my other auntie cecilia yeah. so she's the one that took us under her wing all of us and then obviously as time passed you know she's got her own um child um you know she she's old and we wanted her to uh, enjoy her life now rather than trying to look after all of us um so therefore marietta you know, took over, so... Because there's that as well, like, I mean, like, um, I can understand how you're grateful for your family, mm. but also part of your brain as well feels like you're burdening yeah. them as yeah. well, you know, but you're not. Yeah. But there's that's like kind of like a, I guess, a self-imposed guilt yeah. that probably sometimes comes. Um, that's so tragic <laughs> to hear, but <laughs> like the flip side, the flip side to that is that like, Honestly, man, to every tough thing that happens in life, like they happen for a reason. They happen for a reason. And they create, like um, those moments create in you things that um, you see that you probably didn't know that you had in yourself. Yeah. And you are an amazing athlete. You're really good at what you do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You are, you are, you are. Aren't you the best in New Zealand at the moment? You're powerlifting? Oh, I was. I was. And then um, some other, you know, strong female athlete, you know, as as they do come around, um, she's taken over. So um, that last, no, well, last year COVID happened and then the year before that. So that was my last 
last journey of powerlifting. Um, I did powerlifting for five years, mm. and then um, so now I've decided to take on you know something else or try something different. Um, I'm a huge advocate of do step out of your comfort zone, do something that you are so. If, can I swear? No, sure, you swear, you say whatever you want. <laughs> that, <laughs> you can do whatever do the fuck you whatever, want. Yeah, do whatever you're shit at and be great at that. You know, I mm. I am a huge believer of of somebody that comes out of nothing. Working and, on your weaknesses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because then if you work on your weaknesses and you put together with what you're great at, you've got you're a tool of amazing, you know, these things. And and I do believe that everybody have these talent and, you know, these are your gifts. You know, these are your gifts that um, obviously, you know, the man above have give, has given you. You don't know what it is yet, so might as well go out and do everything possible that you can. And along the way, you will inspire others to do the same. And mm-hmm. that's my biggest thing is, you know, I may be shit at this, but mm-hmm. hey, give me a year, two years, but I will be the greatest at it afterwards. Do you see, that's the mindset. That's the mindset that not many people have. Yeah. Because a lot of people try something that's too hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, okay, I'll give it another go. It's too yeah. hard. <laughs> I know. I'm like, okay, I'll give it one more go. It's definitely too hard. It's not for me. That's yeah, it. And they yeah. don't. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right about that. Um, I don't know what it is that's in the waters right now. <laughs> weakness. It is weakness. Yeah. That's what's in the we water. Don't be a punk bitch. Don't be a punk bitch. <laughs> yeah, man. But no. Um, Some people give up too easily. They, they just give uh, up too easily. I mean, in, in a sense, yes. But then also it's, it's who they surround themselves with. Mm. You know, with myself, because I had that scenario, because, you know, my parents were taken off me. From then on, I switched to... There is nothing that can take me down from here. This is the worst that could happen to anybody. So if anything that's going to come my way, come at me. Like, you know, everything that I've, I've done, I physically, mentally, I've gone through. I've failed so many times mm-hmm. and I've looked at it a no, no, this pain has nothing compared to losing my parents. So let me try again. Let me go even harder. And I've always been so stubborn with what I do, you mm-hmm. know. That competitiveness, yeah, yeah, I want to be the best, I want to be the best, but that stubbornness and that discipline to want to just keep going, Mm. believe me, I've had my failures, I've had times where I've, you know, with my lifting, I've dropped the bar, I've choked myself, I don't know if you've seen my video of when I did weightlifting, I've I've literally... seen a few of them. (laughs) The one where I knocked myself out. No, No. what happened? happened. Oh my God, you have to... What were you doing? Oh, I was doing a clean and jerk, so this, so... Um, I was doing a clean and jerk. How heavy is the bar? (laughs) Oh, I don't even know. I can't remember because... So I cleaned it up and then um, I think I I caught it too high that I just pretty much just took myself out, choked myself out. Instead of resting on... Yeah, instead of resting it here, I rested too high. I literally hit my throat. I choked myself out and before I know it, all I saw was the ceiling and I was just going back. You get to see the video. Like, I, I laugh at, I laugh at oh, it yeah. now, but back then, everybody was having, you know, heart attacks and stuff. But yeah, I but literally... Back and this was at Nationals. Oh. So it was live TV. Okay. I think I have seen this. <laughs> you probably... A while ago. Yeah, it went viral. What are you talking about, Mike? Stop trying. <laughs> oh, no. Well, this is quite... This is a while ago, right? Yeah, no, this, this was... Yeah, about a couple of years ago. But... Um, you fall back and hit your head? Fall back, hit my head. I was... I, I blacked out for probably like literally two seconds and then yeah. I woke up and then I thought that it was the beginning of my comp day so I was looking oh at the God. ceiling and I just saw these people and I was like oh it's comp day like today like I'm waking up it's the morning and then before I know it random people started coming in and they were like no you're at like are you okay you're here and then I got up and I'm like oh yes no no yeah I got choked out and after that <laughs> I walked out that was my first attempt so with this you have three attempts so that was my oh no that was my second attempt my first attempt I got it oh, I didn't get it and then I think that was my second attempt and so I walked out and obviously they gave me the you know no no deal that was no lift and I'm like really that that was that no can, can I go get, no okay that's all good so that was the I know a lift. I walk out and my coach is like, you know you've got to go again because you haven't... How long have you got in between before they count you out again? So it just depends on the lift. So with weightlifting, it's the weight goes up and you just go in and out when your weight is. So if if I was to go in at 95 kgs and nobody else is going in at 96, 97, 98, at 100, I would be next in I think a minute or two. Right. So I only had that time. 
Right. Whereas with powerlifting, um, the numbers don't, the numbers go up, but you stay the same. So if I was first and there's 10 of oh, us, yes, I'll yes, always yes. be first. So therefore that gives me enough time. So from that mindset of, I got heaps of time to, right. you only got two minutes. I, I had to learn the hard way, but hey, we switched on. So I went backstage and I was <laughs> like to my coach, I think we're good, for, like we're done for today. And he's like, no, you can't, this is nationals. You can't just pull out now if you don't make a lift you're pretty much out, you're disqualified. But you're possibly concussed. Yeah, I, exactly. And I was like, <laughs> and then he goes, just warm up, just just, just put on some weights and just see how you feel. I was like, okay, yep, that's fine. Picked up the weight, got up, I was shaking. Oh I was God. literally shaking. What was your head like? Uh, on, uh, Could so, you feel your equilibrium? Could you feel balanced? I honestly, well, in my planet. head, I was going, if coach says I'm good, I'm, I'm good. good. And that's how much faith I had in my coach. And for me, I one thing is for sure is I'm a good athlete. Mm. You know, you tell me what to do, I will do my best at it. You have, if you believe in me, and I don't believe in myself, I will go out there and give it my all. So from that, that was a defining moment for me and my coach. And I just, I, I was shaking, and because <laughs> we had another another helper as well. He looked at me like. <laughs> and my coach was like, you're good. And I was like, yeah, we're good. Now we're good. Everybody around me were like, Are you, this girl is going to go again. So we went out. We went out. And guess what? We took out nationals that, that year. Oh, my God. <laughs> we made it. What a story. <laughs> so, did yeah. You, did you get your head checked afterwards? Yeah, of course. I, well, I, I got it checked during it. And, you know, he was asking me all these questions. Yeah. The doctor, oh, thank God there was a doctor there. And he said, no, if... She's fine, you know. If you want her to go right. again, she's fine. I was like, no, I'm fine. And obviously, I, you know, spoke to my coach. Um, oh, and my sister, she was just bawling her eyes out because she was there, and you know, she was crying and everything. And I guess that was another defining moment for me to show her that, yeah, I fell, yeah, I failed, but hey, you can always come back to what whatever happens. You know, with anything, you can always come back and give it a go. If I fail again. At least I gave it a go and I, I gave it my best, you know. And you won. So and and we took it out. So that was that was awesome. Lucky to have the doctor. See, there. not many people would do that either. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people would probably walk out of the comp, especially if they got knocked out. Yeah, yeah, no. So again, it, it became a moment where I was just like, "What's the worst that can, everything?" You know, I always like I said, everything that always happens to me, you know, from when you know my mom and dad passed away onwards it was just a what's the worst i i, I feel like i became a rebel too in that sense mm. you know it, it's almost dangerous as mm. well now that we're thinking about it and talking about it it's almost like i would put myself in situations where what's you know where i would it, it was Something dangerous <laughs> yeah, yeah but i was willing i was willing to risk it all On just to go again just to go again so um yeah that, that's amazing. Do you see that as one of your highest moments or one of your most challenging moments that defined you? Oh, challenges in my sporting career. Do you, yeah, do you see that moment as probably, no? No, no. no. Wow. I, okay. I, I, that was definitely not a, um, oh wow. My defining moment in my career was, I think it was my, my, my last big comp at, um, where I went to Canada for world champs for powerlifting. Yes. Yeah, so that was one of my defining moments. It was, um, you know, I, you know, you prep for so long. You, you invest in something. I do remember this. This is when you were working at Ludus. Yes, yeah. yes. You, you invest in something. You, you give it your all. Um, you make sacrifices. You know. Can I just ask? Yes. Like when you're being a powerlifter for New Zealand, are you getting paid? No, mm. no. So a lot of these sports. Um, this could be another topic we could talk about. <laughs> it's good that we talk about it. Like, yeah. Because, so obviously, so, okay, how about now? No, Up, it's still there's not no paid. pay. No, no pay. So every power lifter that I see that's representing New Zealand has a full-time job? Has a full-time job. Um, so all the training and everything is extra, curricular, extra. Yeah. and your own time. Your own time. And a lot of the, um, you can get sponsorship, you know, um, but that sponsorship's only for your equipment, yeah. for your um, clothes, for yeah. your supplements. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Right. Um, with myself, I was like, somebody to sponsor to... your rent. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> My schedule <laughs> to drive to training. No, no. But um, I, I was very lucky for that comp to be. Um, to have my family, because I, you know, with us Pacific Islanders, we're always trying to come together to help each other. So with my family, they said, put a social on, put a social on, you know, the tickets, put 
put big, you know, um, it will be expensive, but when you when you talk about it, the meaning behind it, people will love to get on top of that and, you know, support you. So I did. Um, so I had a social, um, we all love to get down and again, have a good time with everybody. Everybody wants to get together. They just want to have a good reason for it as well. Sure, there's so, an excuse. Yeah, all that as well. Um, <laughs> excuse to drink, have fun, spend time with each other. Mm. So, so I was able to get uh, my sponsorship for that to um, pay for flights, accommodation, fees, everything, everything you have to pay for yourself. So with, you know, um, Crazy. I, with powerlifting, um, I know with weightlifting, you don't get paid until obviously you're the best of the best, you know? Right. So until you represent New Zealand, yeah. you don't get paid. So starting, you know, you know, and this is, I guess, very um, intimidating or a bit um, put off with some parents and some kids when they go into a sport like this, you know, they'll come in and they'll be like, oh, I like this, I really enjoy it. Um, you know, my daughter has all the talent, she's strong, this is what she's capable of, I can do it. So where do we go to get paid? Or where can she go to start getting paid for doing this? And then, you know, it, the coaches are like, oh, unfortunately, well, she has to train, she has to commit, she has to do all the training, and then be f she has to be the best. She has to be number one to be able to get paid for it. Literally number one. Literally number, Literally one. number one. There is no number two, number three. No, you have to be number one. Because when, when you're at international level and you're competing with other athletes from other countries, yeah, yeah. Um, are they getting paid? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I would don't. ask. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, with powerlifting, no. Okay. Powerlifting, no. Um, I haven't spent enough time in the weightlifting, um, you know, world to understand what the concept is. Is, but I'm I'm pretty sure they're quite similar as well. Obviously, you know, when you're the best, um, you get paid. But as starting up, um, it's all your time. All so your yeah. Business. So when you have your like your own coach, your own lifting coach mm. and stuff, like who pays him? We do. Athletes, athletes pay them. I mean, they've got to, they've still got to make a living as well. But even the payment that goes towards these coaches, it's, it's not a lot. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's just be a minimum for mm. myself as, you know, as an athlete going in and having these amazing, talented, very passionate coaches helping. I look at them and I'm like that, the payment that we give you is just not enough. You know, for for your. Uh, you know, for your knowledge, for your um, specialty, it's just not enough. Um, so it's not that, you know, I don't want them to hate on the coaches and be like, oh, why are you charging them? You know, they have to pay for you. No, they, they have to make a living too. 100%. You know, yeah. um, it's we're just lucky enough that there's enough coaches that are passionate about it as much as the athletes are mm. to have this mutual, oh, yep, yeah, I'll pay you this amount because obviously I've still got to, you know, work full time and they understand that. So as an athlete and as a coach, I think there's a mutual understanding of respect of, yes, I understand that you still have to make a living, but at the same time, the coaches, oh, I understand that you still have to work full time and take out of your time to come and do this. Imagine if you could do it full time. It, imagine. I mean... Imagine how much better you would be. Oh, with the time to rest. You know what, Mike, stop properly. it because you're, you're trying to sell me this athlete. <laughs> that I've always wanted but you know um, I mean that's that's I guess in that concept yeah with it sucks being a female sometimes because as even being the best is not enough money for for yourself and for your family well hold for on, me hold on so you're saying that there's more money for male athletes I feel like there is right definitely um, you know it's in the sense of they just are prioritized I, I guess so yeah yeah um mm. I don't <laughs> annoying the same conversation that I had with Fee <laughs> sitting there um yeah. I want to say as well like um, after talking to Fee about that the amount of uh, feedback that I got back about that was a lot of disgust at the level of how um our New Zealand athletes are treated and how their sport was like looked down on mm -hmm. but it's I think it's because not many people talk about it that's never really widely known. So I never knew the yeah. stuff that she was telling me either until she told me. Stuff like playing in like guys' used jerseys. Yeah. You know, all that stuff about funding and stuff. Like um, New Zealand has literally some of the best athletes in the world. Yeah. But the fact that we don't get behind our, fi our women and support them as much as we support the males, yeah. is, to me it's just, it's just stupid, it's ridiculous. I know, I know. It's... <sighs> it's yeah it, it irritates me yeah. but it also um it, it makes me you know it drives me to want more and do better and obviously you know 
do the best that I can to um, keep like, the door open for yeah, women yeah, that are coming sure. through, and hopefully you can change the stuff that's happening so that yeah, yeah, they can get paid. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's uh, that you know that conversation of female getting paid um, that. It's, it's there, it's working, it's just slowly working. So in that concept, I, I can't force, I can't push anybody, I can't make them pay the athletes. So in my sense, what I can do um, as a female is um, have alternative ways that can help them, you know, it's sponsorship, but also talk about, oh, you know, the police force, you know, they, they are a huge um, advocate of supporting women in sport. You know, um, like Fee and also um, Charmaine Smith, they they are perfect examples of athletes that can do both, and that. But it's because they are they were forced. You know, they were forced to do both, and they they sat down and you know said, "Hey, I love doing this, and I love doing this, so I'm gonna do both." And you know, as myself being in the police force, I am lucky enough to be in a force that supports me doing sports. Mm. Um, so you know, I'll have when I was doing my competitions. When I was going away, uh, being in the police force, they were very supportive. They they said, oh, you know, if, if this is something that obviously you want to do in the long term, um, if, you know, once you start representing New Zealand, you are able to get paid going away. So you are able to, you know, ask for leave, but obviously, in, you know, all with the special conditions and everything. But they, they were very supportive in that sense. Oh, so there, there's options out there for females. Right. And I think that's one thing that a lot of us females don't, or younger girls coming out of school, don't know that there is. So, um, you know, I, so before police, I I went into a course where they helped me get into the police force, and that's called Te Wananga. Um, so, you know, the the break from high school to uni or high school to life, mm. there is a huge gap or that nobody knows where to go. You know, for right. myself, when I finished high school, the change from high school to uni, I was left, you were left on your own. I had to look for things. I had to go out and find things. It was really just you. Whereas from high school, your teacher was always there. And you, you had that one favorite teacher where you could always ask for anything, you know. So for myself, I always want to be that, I guess, um, how do you say, that bridge, you know, for kids that finish high school and be like, oh, I don't know where, where I need to go. I want to go to uni or I don't know. You know, but I want to have a nice job that will support me and my family, but at the same time will help me with my sporting career. Mm. Because, you know, a lot of us females out there, especially our brown sisters, they're so talented. Mm. The sporting, you know, um, area, they, they are, there's so many of these brown girls in there. Mm. It's, the talent is just, it, it's there. It's amazing to see the talent, but also from that, it's almost like they they don't know where they can use you know other things, their other skills. So that's I guess my biggest thing is trying to navigate them mm. with that. Say, oh, you know, you can have this job and still have your sporting career. You can study and still have your sporting career. You know, until you obviously you know decide what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um. So when you were at high school, once you left high school, what did you want to do? You weren't sure. After high school, I always wanted to be a police officer. Okay. Yeah. So I did. I, I applied. I applied after high school. When you were um, about 17, 16? Yeah, yep. 17. Um, <clears throat> I applied. Mm. and But throughout the process, I felt so overwhelmed by everything that I was, you know, f- all the information I was getting left, right, center, everything about policing. You've got to um, know a lot of law. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, for okay. sure. And and life experiences, you know. Right. Um, a lot of people don't understand that with this job, um, you're going in to deal with real problems. Um, and you're going in to be this leader that the people of your community looking up to for guidance, you know. So that's a lot of responsibility for somebody who's 17 years old that's just finished high school and is still trying to navigate themselves through life. You know, yeah. so from that, I I was just I wasn't ready, right. and so I I pulled the plug and I was like, okay, no, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready to have somebody else's life in my hands, mm. you know. So I said, no, I'm too young. Let me just check out this active lifestyle that I want to do. So um, after that, I 
I went to uni, so I studied a Bachelor in Arts degree in Drama and Pacific Studies. I was a what? bit of a drama queen. Yeah, I know, nobody knows that. <laughs> this is something else Bachelor that I Bachelor of did. Arts majoring in Drama and what? Pacific Studies. Drama and Pacific Studies. Yeah. Okay. I, I love Auckland Uni? Auckland Uni. Wow. I loved, you know, um, my drama classes in year 12, 13. That was... Which high school? Maris College. Okay. Yeah. So that was the that was the place where I could be myself. You know, um, growing up as, um, you know, like you said, as a young Polynesian kid, you you are told to do, to be somebody, to you know, and with all these things on your shoulders, you just sometimes you just want to be, you. Mm. And you don't find that until you get put into a room where um, in drama you you just pretend to be th- these things, you know. You pretend to be these characters. You Escape. Yeah, you just do whatever you want to do and you be yourself. And so that's where I started to, you know, come out of my shell. I was a really shy kid, Mike. Really right. shy, you right. know. But <laughs> I, I then, can understand. I can, yeah. And then when I did drama classes, it, it brought that other side of me. And, you know, and then I learned from being able to be that character mm. to come out and say hey I, I can be this person outside of it as well and still have that sense of belonging that culture behind me all the values and everything so in, in that sense that's what I did and so from there I loved it so much that I just carried on with um, uni and then um with that, I was also working at the gym, so health and sports in Morningside, just a receptionist. Did you ever carry on with like your drama? Like, did you get an agent? Yeah, well, I I started doing so many things that I guess it was just my pathway. I didn't get an agent, but right. I was still studying. I did my degree, and throughout that, I they saw that I was into my you know lifting, and I love you know getting people out and active and stuff. That my boss from my gym offered me a scholarship to do my PT course, so they were okay. going to pay for it while I worked there. So I was like, hey, might deal. as well another thing that I can just add to my you know skills. So I said, yep, put my hand up for it. I went for it. So I I went down that you know personal training pathway, and it worked out with my lifting as well. And so I did all of that. Stayed there for about six years, you know. At uni. Climb at, um, so I was doing uni yeah. and I was doing my PT course and working full time at um, Health and Sports. So I started climb the ladder Damn. of, you know, receptionist. That's a busy life. Yeah, very, <laughs> you know, receptionist. Um, started doing fitness instructing and then when I was qualified, became a personal trainer and then obviously, um, and then I managed the gym on my last year. And then um, I got to a point where I was like, you know what? Um, why don't I give that policing thing a go? Mm. And so after all of that, I I reapplied. And how did you find managing a gym? It was it was interesting, yeah. but my love for you know being in a gym made it easier. Um, mm. I was always a people's person, and I think that was that was one thing that was that that stood out for me and made it easier for me to talk to people and manage people was that I was always for the people, you know. So. If my staff wasn't happy about something, um, they were able to talk to me about it. Or if they wanted to talk to somebody else, they had that. Um, yeah, you kind of have to be a people's person to yeah. manage a gym. Eh? <laughs> Especially you know, not just that, but you also have like a lot of complaints and stuff that you have to yeah. do your work. Oh, and oh, oh, yes, the keep complaint. customers happy and yes, fix yes. the showers. And, yes, yeah. all, all the nitty gritty stuff. Get in there, but um, I, you know. I do know. I do know. Do you know? I remember. Um, one of the probably the biggest problems of managing the gym that you and I worked at was when the lights used to go out. Oh. Like I don't know if you were ever present, but there were oh, a couple of yes. times. There were a couple of times when like the power would go out. Yeah, yeah. And like I'd be calling like one of the other, like the, our local electrician who was like a friend, and he'd come over and go through the fuse box of a torch while the class is going, Still and we'd have like candles around the gym oh floor. My like, God. but um, hey, with your um, with your PT, do you yes. um? Do you still take uh, like one-on-one PT people? Uh, no, I yeah. don't have the time. I right. wish I had. I wish I had the time. Is it still a passion of yours, training people one-on-one? Yeah, definitely. You still enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Um, instead of, I guess, doing that one-on-one, I use my platform um, now to 
you know, be able to motivate, you know, so right. I can still motivate, I can still engage with people on my platform, obviously on Instagram a lot of the times. But um, yeah, so I still get to do that one on one session, you know, people will ask me, Oh, what's the best exercise for this? Or what can I do for this? And I give them what I think, you know, um, but it yeah so i i still love it Mm. i still i think it's still it'd be even when wherever i go um i think that teaching concept will always be there for me right and and no matter what i do so you know when i do this and obviously from my learnings for the next person that's coming i i would give them tips i would help them out you know i'm a huge believer of when you get to wherever you want to be might as well have somebody come up at the top views always great with friends right that's right yeah that's right um so you know, I, with everything, you know, when you get to some, I always remember that once you get to a place, mm. there was, you know, you were, you were there or your mindset wasn't like that before you got there. Right. So another person's coming, you know, following you, what would you do to help them? You know, what would you, what would you, what advice would you give to help them get to where you are? Because somebody always wants to be where you are wants to get where you are and then from then on you move on and then that person can take over and say hey and then they make it a better place and then they obviously will get the next person ready and then that person comes over and it becomes it, it just becomes such a mm. you know a great environment to obviously work in and i love what you're talking about what you're talking about is like creating a nurturing environment yes yeah not everyone thinks the way you think barbara yeah <laughs> No, because what you're talking about is like leaving the door open behind you. Yeah, yeah. Of like helping people come through yeah. and possibly even going further than you. Yeah. However, some people come through and they're like, mm, I'm going to shut this door. Yeah. I'm going to keep all this. <laughs> you know, but I, I yeah. love the way that you think. That's a very positive way to think about, yeah. you know, yeah. always continuing something and helping others coming yeah. from behind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a very generous way of thinking. Yeah. And that, that's what creates like a nurturing, positive environment. Yeah. There's people like you that are able to like do that for people that are coming through. Yeah. Because you're right. Because when you get to a certain place, mm-hmm. like your mindset was not always at that place when you first started out. And so you understand it about people that are coming through. Yeah. And you want to guide their journey and you want to make it as comfortable for them mm-hmm. as it is. And you want them to try and like avoid some of the things that you had to go through yep. you know. so <laughs> yeah, um, yeah for sure that's almost like a parenting thing that I know. <laughs> yeah there as well yeah I it's very mature so. it's a very mature way of looking at things yeah yeah um how long have you been in the police force for uh two years now okay yeah so how are you finding it loving it i i still wake up you know going what is it today mm-hmm. who are we chasing today <laughs> who are we chasing today okay so right. let's go <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I still love the job. Um, and I think I always, you know, love it till who knows. And, you know, I tell people that, oh, you're going to stay for like, yeah, of course I am. That's great. So you it's know? everything that you thought it would be? Yes, and more. And more. And a lot more. Okay. Um, very rewarding. Very rewarding. No, definitely. Um, it's, it's a job that... Like you must come across some dickheads, though. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I don't know what it is, but it's just, you know, you know, I'm a huge believer of um, you get out what you put in or the energy that you put out is the energy that's going to come to you. Mm. So I've I've come across. Yeah, yes, they're dickheads. But once they, I start talking to them, they're just like, oh, sorry, miss. I just thought you were, you know, those stink cops that mm. always, you know. And, and I'm like, all good, bro. Like, and they're like, man, you just talk just like us. And I'm like, yes, I, I am, you know. And I think that's that's a lot of um, misconception around the police force. Um, and, you know, I for myself, when I put that uniform on, I'm, it's not my uniform. It belongs to the people that were there before me. Right. You know, they they created that pathway for us, and obviously they made sacrifices for us. And so when it's it's it doesn't belong to me. The uniform doesn't belong to me. I'm just another, I guess, holder of it, or another you know somebody who's just looking after it for somebody else. So when I put it on and I go to work, but there's a certain reputation of it that has to be upkept. Yes, yeah. for sure. Obviously, with that professionalism that comes with it, um, and you know, with and the values and the beliefs and all of that. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of um, another misconception of once you become the police, do you always have to be da 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 or strict strict? You know, and you there's now nowadays, I think with policing, there's a um, an empathy you know um from who 
from from us and for for, for us I mean for people that work right. and for the community as well their understanding of you know with a lot of things that have gone down um, you know the COVID and all of that we're still people that go yes we have to uphold these rules and enforce these rules but at the end of the day I'm still going back home to my family you know so um yeah i understand that you know something happened with a certain police officer that you don't like and then when i come to your house i i get people you know smell my face i get people who just slam the door on my face i get people who just you know throw punches anything but they don't know me yet i've just literally stepped on in front of their door they see the blue uniform they don't see the person and then once i start talking to them they're just like oh my god you're you're just just like us and I'm just You're human. Yeah, yeah, mm. you know. Um yes, we put on these things. Yes, we have all these armors and you know, but mm. at the end of the day we strip them all off and we go back home to our families who who are worried when we go away to these jobs, you mm. know. So um I think it, there's still a, a building, you know, relationship or, you know, connection between there. But I think I'm, those sort of people they have like a sort of stereotype of what the police is. Yes. They have a stereotype and they don't they don't necessarily think that they don't see you for you. Yeah. They see yeah. you as the uniform. And they yeah. might have those stereotypes for like maybe the way they grew up mm. or from what they hear their parents talk about the police. Yeah. You know I mean those things like they grow up with them always in their mind so they think the police is this yeah and the police is the enemy and that sort of stuff and yeah that doesn't help you no no it doesn't yeah. but um you know for myself as you know my personal views going in is i i'm there to help the people i'm there to do the best that i can be with the tools that i have and the knowledge that i have you know so um you know one defining moment with my job is that i was able to help somebody was um so you know we go people don't understand that we go to a lot of deaths as well um we're there on the scene to obviously do our investigation and everything but we're the ones that tell the families you know so um one time one of my jobs was one time there was a, a sam ward family um so their daughter passed away and how old was she she was only 16 and this was um you know this was through sickness so um with any any deaths um obviously it needs to be investigated and that would be you know going towards the current um current and stuff and so our job is to obviously you know try and make them understand that this is the process of it and coming from, you know being someone we don't understand that process. I didn't understand it until I became a police officer. I didn't understand why. What do you to- say? What? Do, what is? Um, sorry, break it down for me. What does the process mean? What is? What is so what's the, involved in that? So, with the process, obviously, when you know um, somebody's passed away, we mm. go there. Um, we need to investigate what happened. If it's, right. um, it, you know, if it was natural, you know, causes, other natural yeah, or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if right. it was natural and the doctors are able to sign it off and say, yeah, it, you know, it was going to happen, then yes, that that's okay. Um, whereas if it's not, then obviously we need to take the body away and start investigation. Mm. And I think that's the part that a lot of families um, find it hard. And like I said, I totally understand. You know, I with my family as well, if somebody was to pass away, I wouldn't want anybody. You know, that's that's sacred. Right. And that's you know that's still your family members and you don't want to go through that so from my experience i was able to speak someone to the family and translate what my sergeant was trying to explain to them because they couldn't understand they didn't understand and they right. were finding it hard and so we were finding it hard to, to be able to go yeah and get through that process um and then you know lucky that i was able to speak someone that i was able to translate that and make it you know, so that they can understand that if we were able to find out what happened to her, we can, you know, obviously test the rest of your family and see if it might happen to you and prevent that. And that's and that's what what it's all about. Is the forefront of it is that we want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And because that's not coming across through the message, uh, you know, when you try to translate it, big words and you know, auntie and uncle and mum and dad are just like yeah, yeah, yeah but really they, they don't, don't understand. It, yeah. That's really cool. You're um so. If, even though you came over when you were eight, you're still fluent with your Samoan. Yes, yes. Cause, um, you speak it at home? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah Auntie Hamad, who obviously when we came over, she would speak it at home to us. So I was very lucky that she would, she did that for us. Because, um, yeah, a lot of kids, you know, when they come over, they just want to um, learn the language and then they kind of forget 
about you know their native language so right. um, but I was lucky enough to have my auntie being strict and you know when we're back home you only speak Samoan that's such an important thing it's very <laughs> so, important yeah. Yeah, yeah what was your English like when you came over uh, not that great <laughs> right did you know, know any at all no no I was no like English. eight yeah. yeah so no no English at all but um, I was just known as the sporty kid so that was kind of my go to like hey it's a Samoan sporty kid say, hey <laughs> And you just learned to, just, as, as you went along. Yeah, you, you just learn to pick things up, you know, especially at eight. Um, it I must have been hard. It was hard. Yeah. Um, I don't know, growing Because you'd feel left out and stuff, like if you're not understanding. Because you, what primary school did you go to? I went to Mary's Primary, so right. they were quite back to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Primary to college. Um, yeah. But were you in like a Samoan unit? Or no? No, no, it was, yeah. yeah, so it was quite, you know, obviously diverse, but um, I think there was only about three, three Samoan kids there. And, right. You know, obviously you kind of just start, you know, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, Samoans, yeah, like you just kind of glued together and start helping each other out and everything. But um, no, I actually, it wasn't too bad in primary. Um, like I said, I was just a, a kid and you know, in a new country and, you know, and in my head I was just thinking, I'm just here to, you know, learn and do the best that I can be and, you know, the whole send money back home thing. So that was the, you know, mm. concept around my mind of things. And Were you happy to come over when you first came over? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> of yeah. course not, you know, you're leaving yeah. your parents. Yeah. Uh, well, mum, so my mum came over to drop me off yeah. um, and stayed for about, I think, two or three months just right. to make sure that Settle I was comfortable. You yeah, you know, I was eight years old. Well, okay, what was the um, what was the main idea of bringing you over? Well, like, were they planning to, like, if they have kids, send them one by one to New Zealand? Uh, well, I was just, I think I was just the tester, right? <laughs> you know, like, hey, you know, we obviously there was nothing in Samoa, you know, you, you go to school, you go to college, and then after that, you either get a job, which the best paying job there is being a teacher um, and, you know, office work, or you just stay home and help mom and dad and do the plant- plantation and everything, you know, so they, they saw something better for me mm. and um, you know as much as I had to leave they had to make that sacrifice as well of letting their daughter go and trusting their sister and this you know in a completely new country you know um, when your parents were alive what were they doing they so mum was so we had a little shop in the islands okay. um, in our village so mum would stay home what do you and, call a little shop in Samoan um, oh we call it a farikoloa in Tongan what do you call it in Samoan oh, I just went my blank <laughs> Oh my god. Like a little dairy. Eh? Faleoloa. Faleoloa. Yeah. Same Faleoloa. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. similar. Okay. Um, but yes, so we had that and then my dad, my dad was a bus driver. Okay. So every time I went back home, I would, all, I, I she, he would be the first person waiting for me with his big bus. And I, you know, that I had all, the, I've still got all these memories of just wanting to get on the bus and being at the front see you know of it all and you know it was colorful loud music and everything was loud and but it was it was yeah one of those moments where you just look back and and, you know but um yeah so he was a bus driver and she was working at the shop imagine you right now yes having a baby (laughs) and the baby start to grow up and you send that baby to primary school starts primary school they start primary school about five mm. and they're only there for about three years and then you decide you're going to send them away yeah how hard that must have been for them you know what I mean like I know it's, um, yeah I'm just trying to get like an idea of who they were and like because obviously like especially and running a little shop as well is um, business instincts is running yeah. your own little business yeah, yeah. Um, but for them for him to like let you go and like send you over, yeah. you know, it's quite hard for any parent to make that sort of sacrifice. But you only ever do it if you have that real long term goal mm. that this is really going to benefit them and provide them for their families in the future. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Like, um, I, know. I think I, see, I think sometimes of like the sacrifices that parents like that make, you know, and having to do that for their children. Yeah. Um, when they're giving up their time with their children and yeah, you know, um, yeah. the knowledge that they can impart on their own children, trusting in like their siblings or other yeah. adults to do yeah. that for them. Yeah, yeah. For it's sure. always quite challenging as well. 
Yeah, and I think that's um, that's amaz- That's something amazing about us, mm. you know, Polynesian families, is that we're able to have that trust to say, hey, to your brother or your sister, you know, this this is my life. You know, I'm literally giving you my life, and it, it's in your hands. You know, and if something happens to, you know, him or her, that's that's a part of me gone. Yeah. You know, so just having that you know being able and then obviously with her sister going yes i will do the best that i can to you know make sure that you know your your child or your son will get the best in everything so that way you know she can grow up and obviously give back and in that sense it's almost like it's such a selfless act from auntie and uncle because that they they don't have to say yes or no but they choose to you know and it's it's not their own you know child but they've chosen to take this person under their wing and say yes i will give everything that i would give to my own child and give you that you know that chance in life i guess and it's 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 an amazing um you know sense of selfless love and obviously sacrifice you know that sacrifice to selfless to and then obviously the child you know being like oh i'm i'm that product of all of this and you know i want to make sure that i do the best that i can and like you mentioned at the beginning you know that comes with a lot of responsibilities and a lot of pressure and a lot of um you need to be somebody to because of all the sacrifices and all you know everything that your aunties and your uncles and mum and dad has done for you and um it has its up and downs you know a lot of um kids can take on that pressure and then some can't mm. um and um with with the job that i have obviously i i deal with youths as well and kids and a lot of them you know we have jobs where a lot of the kids don't have that strong you know um mental or mental state of being able to handle that pressure so you know they they do go to self depression or you know so i guess being able to have that experience and then go into this job and be able to talk to these kids and talk to them say hey i've been there mm. i've i was once there and you know and be able to obviously give some advice anything that hopefully will um help them or guide them through their own little journey of theirs so um yeah so that i guess it leads back to when i first applied no life experience and then all of this happened and then i i went back and applied and it was smooth sailing for my procedure and yeah it's interesting that you recognize that like when you were initially applying yeah that you felt things were you're a little bit out of your depth yeah you know with like the life <laughs> problems because you're going into like people having domestics and stuff yeah and, yeah and situations that you've probably never seen or heard about yeah um yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Pretty bizarre. Yeah, yeah. But um, there must be a whole lot of young cops that do come out at yes. like 18 or yes. so and like I put straight into the deep end and have to grow up real fast. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a tough job. It is, it is. I mean, that's just my, you know, my advice to the young ones that come out of um, school and want to want to jump in, you know. I'm like, the job's always there. The job yeah, will always yeah. be there. But go do life experiences. Go... Go be a 17-year-old, getting drunk with your friends, doing silly things. Um, and then, you know, five years' time, you get into the job because then you, you're you able to connect with people. Right. Because, you know, you've been there. You've been there. Yeah. You know, you're going to go to a job where a kid at 17 years old, they're drunk and, you know, my girlfriend left me and now I'm here by myself. And you're like, I was once 17 and yes, you know, I wasn't happy with things, so I'll drink. But you've got to go home. And so they look at you going, oh, yeah, you understand me, you know. It, it is quite a lot harder, though, you know, when you get into the job at a young age and you're trying to give advice to, you know, people that are a lot 40, older a than you. A 45-year-old <laughs> that's going for a divorce. <laughs> yeah, no, that, you are right, Mike. That is definitely there you know he's he's there he's crying and he's talking to a kid yeah and he's like uniform. what do i do what do i do, do I put the gun down or do <laughs> I? you know and and that and also in the sense of they shouldn't have to go through that at 17 and 18 they, those are responsibilities that they shouldn't have to deal with um for me for me um you know each to their own there are kids that come out at high school that are ready to take on that because they they will you know like gone myself through gone through yeah. some stuff as well they were ready then go for it if yeah. you are ready go for it that's my advice is if you're ready and you feel like you've done everything you wanted to do mm. and that 
go for it. If you come out of high school and you don't know what to do and you're not sure yet, then maybe just just keep doing some life life lessons and go, you know, not more travel. Go do things and go experience life. Live um, life. Yeah. yeah, live life. Like I said, the job will always, always be there for you. What's the cutoff age for qualified to be a cop? There is no cutoff age. You Actually, serious? somebody just graduated. One of the cops just graduated. And I think she's 40 something. Right. She's just graduated. And that's amazing. Well, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is no cutoff age. You know, there's only an age where you have to, obviously, um, over 17 because of, you know, legal age and everything. But there, there is honestly no rush. Wow, it's a, it, you know it comes with a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. It, it, you're dealing with people's problems. You are Doctor Phil, so think of it like that. Can you be Doctor Phil for somebody at yeah. seventeen and eighteen? If you don't want to be Doctor Phil for somebody, yeah. then go and enjoy life, and then come back and be Doctor Phil for somebody. Was it for you? Was it always um, the what was the what was the pull for the police force? Like, did you ever consider like joining the military or doing something kind of similar but different? Yes. Um, okay. So my my auntie and my cousin they're both in the navy. Okay. So growing up, yeah. I saw them and I was like, I want to be in the navy too. I always wanted a job where it required discipline and helping people. So those were my two things that you know. Um, so obviously they they joined and they got into the navy and I was like, I want to be in the navy. And then auntie, no, you can't be in the navy because we're already in here. Go find your own like calling and your own thing. And I was like, oh, I wanted to be in the navy. Okay, fine. You know, you get work out, we get paid to work out, so might as well. But um, so I I you know I looked at the next best thing and I thought, what what is a job that's out there that you know I can help people in my community. Um, and obviously you know uphold this responsibility of looking after others and the police force you know there was there was something that came up to my mind and I was like yeah and if it's if it's meant to happen it will happen and the process will go through so um, yeah like I said I applied the first time was wasn't mm. ready for it and that's okay you know um, with a lot of people I you know when you apply for something and it, it doesn't feel right and it's not working out or you get you don't get accepted that's okay it's okay to say okay i'm gonna leave you you know you wait there in three four years time if that's still on my mind i will come back for you that's right so go do something else everything happens for a reason yes for sure yeah. and go do something else and then obviously there'll come a time where it pops in your head and as soon as it pops in your head that's the right time to go back to it mm. Mm. So when you applied the first time yes. and you didn't get in, is this? <laughs> hold on, is this? Why you want to bring up all my bad? <laughs> no, 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 no! I'm just trying to make sense of this. Yeah, is this when you became? Um, you were a beauty queen. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is that right? No, but this this is yes. how this happened. This is all, yes. Yeah. See, it all happens See. for a reason, right? So yeah, when I applied, that didn't happen. I was like, okay, so I and that all the drama and all of that, that all kind of. How, how did the idea of becoming a beauty pageant first come up? Well, because I'm doing, I, I was doing a bachelor in um, Pacific studies and all of that. So my culture was a, a big thing for me as well. You know, I wanted to know more about my culture, and obviously, I wanted to go back to the islands and give back to them and see what what ways I can help them. So a beauty pageant was one of those things, and I was just doing modeling on the side after school, you know. And then one of my friends was like, "Oh, why don't you just?" apply for this and see how it goes and then again i said oh yeah i'll apply if it if if it's a go it's a go if it's not maybe it's not for me so yeah. um, i put my application through i was lucky enough to be one of you know finalists and everything and then the process just went through and um yeah it's oh god it was a long time ago that <laughs> i'm trying to remember did you enjoy it i enjoyed it yeah okay. all of it it was sure. it was it was awesome um I think it was also one of those finding myself mm. kind of things, you know, at a young age, um, I wanted to know more about my culture. Um, and I also wanted to step out of my comfort zone. I wasn't your typical, you know, beauty pageant queen. I was, I was, you know, very active back then. So obviously my, you know, body type wasn't the same as, uh, you know, what they would stereotype a, a beauty queen body type. What's you know? the stereotype of a... A, well, each to their player. own, but I was, I will talk about myself. Sure, let's hear it. <laughs> you know, I was quite masculine. I, you know, I wasn't um, as slim, you know, as well. So I had the Tara legs, hey. So. What year is this? This was, oh. 2012? 
Right. To 2010, yeah, I finished high school at 2010, 2011. Yeah, around 2012. So, um, yeah, it's it's changed over the years a That's lot. That's why I wanted to ask you yeah, year this no, because it's definitely it's kind changed. of stupid, isn't it? I know. That you uh, should associate like a... Uh, beauty pageants both being slim and yes yes I know but um, I yeah that was I think that was another rebellious thing that I wanted to do as well to say hey yes I'm this type but I don't I don't care I'm gonna do what I want to do this is what I want to do I'm gonna step up to it and show you guys what I got kind of thing and also it's kind of like showing other girls like yeah you can be anybody type just step up and own what you got, you know? You're quite young at this time. You're about 18? Yes. Where do you get that sort of self-confidence from? Oh, my God. Drama yeah. class? <laughs> right. No. Oh, where do I get that? I, I don't know. I have guess. you always had that sort of self? Not many Not many um, Pacific Island girls or Maori girls have that sort of self-confidence to really step right out there yeah. and claim yeah. that space. Yeah. Especially yeah. when what you just said is that it doesn't necessarily fit the right stereotype or people's idea yeah. of what should be accepted. So where do you get that sort of self confidence from? Because that's a that's that's a massive asset to have yeah. in life and in everything you do. If you've got that sort of self confidence, then you're almost you're unbeatable. You can't be even if you do get beaten, it's not even counted as beaten. You just you just learn from it. You get back up and you fight again. Where do you get that from? Oh God. I- it's probably from my mum I mean she was always she owned everything she did right you know so I think that was kind of a trait that I didn't even know I was picking up from her because I Raps always off on yeah because <laughs> we always said but I was like no I'm better at this you know no 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 um, but like I said it was because of that defining moment of losing them that mm. I, I became almost uh, you know I became a savage yes you know I, <laughs> I became like a, you know like watch me you tell me I can't do this, watch me. Mm. It may not take a week, it may not take two weeks, but I will get there, you know? Gave you like a fighting spirit. Yeah, for sure. Because it, it almost because of my rage that my parents were taking from me, yes. that it became something that I was, it was, it was almost like I was fighting with fire. life. I was yeah. fighting with life. I was fighting with God. I was fighting with everybody that were, I don't, you know, you, you create these scenarios in your head where they're like, oh, well, their parents are gone. So, um, what what do they make of themselves now kind of thing and so i'm just like i get it i get it you know i understand I, and I get um, it, yeah with myself when when i do things they talk about my mom and dad we know it's it's such a sad one thing like sure. oh they don't say oh here comes barbara they go here comes low ian galota's child so they bring you know my parents up and i love that i thrive off that because they're not here anymore so i want to make sure that they know they they were gone but their their spirit and everything still lives through me and that I will continue their name you know so I think that's where that confidence came and um and growing up I you know everything that I did my mom would always say you're special there's just something about you you know you're gonna you're gonna create this pathway where people will just want to follow you and then they'll do their own things but you're gonna create something that you know these kids are gonna Step on. It's almost Feel like inspired. yeah. <laughs> you Create step that on. Inspiration. Yeah. yeah. You, you step on, and then um, you 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 open this pathway for them to create their own thing. Um, you start a spark. Yeah. Inside people, you start a spark. Yeah. Because you know, you've got your own fire. Yeah. But yeah, you create a sure. spark of like inspiration within people to like see yeah, what yeah. they want to do. You know. Yes. And it doesn't yes. have to necessarily follow you, but yeah. it just means that they can be able to see within themselves yeah yeah they for can sure follow something or believe in something that they might have kind of put down within themselves yeah yeah um you know because i've had i've had all of that i've had people you know say you can't do this you can't do that you can never be a nobody who so- told you that <laughs> i know right let's go get who told you that but you know just people just, have told you that you people, can't do this you yeah, can't do that people have told me and I, people still do you right. know people still do with new things new things Um, they still continue to tell me oh you know oh you think you can or you oh. but you know the biggest thing for me is um, when I when I want to when I have somebody so this can be like a little life thing but um, so when I started to teach a class when I was doing PT, yes. um, people will come into my class, right? And some people will be like, "Ugh, I'm forced to do this," you know. So I have to be in this class. So when I get these class, I I get the attention. So I'm like, "Hey, welcome to my class, Luders. You know, welcome to my Luders class." And then someone is like, not listening, then I'm like, "Do you want to be here or you want to be out? Because I don't want your energy." <laughs> and they're like, 
<laughs> you know, they're like, are you serious? Is this girl, like, are you pointy? <laughs> and I'm like, I get you paying rent for us, but you got to go because I don't need this because there are people here that want to be here. If you want to be here, you stay here and you train with us because oh this is energy, you know? This, is, you- this has happened? <laughs> this has happened? <laughs> and they're all like, the, the audacity of this girl. And, but, you know, they laugh it off. They, they get up and they're like, oh, oh, okay, you know. As always, they... It, it, but I put it in a way where it's not like, oh, da 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 get out kind of thing. It's kind of like, do you want to be here? Because if you want to be here, you got to you gotta match my energy. you got to match my energy. And they're like, oh, okay. So she, she this trainer that's going to come in here. And, you know, with... In a room full of people, there's different personalities, you know, and everybody has to uphold their own. So when they stand up, they're kind of like, okay, look here, I'm a lawyer, and you you standing there telling me what's, and I'm like, you're in my room. This is my room. I'm giving you the respect of being in here, so you give me the respect to teach you and bring you out the best that you can be. And then they look at me like, what? And then, you know, there'll be somebody at the back in the corner hiding and you know I'll be like oh you know what do you like and they say oh I only like oh, this thing or I only like kettlebell swings or I can only do this I can't do this but like, come over here come show we, me your kettlebell swing people. yeah and then excuses been, anyway <laughs> you know and then there could be somebody that is only good at one thing but when I'm in that room and I create this class when I when I when those people leave I want them to know that they are the best version of who they were you know, or who they are trying to be. I want them to have confidence in themselves when they leave, you know, and mm. everything that they do in life, I want them to attack it. So when you, att- you know, come into this workout, you attack it. Like we always say, you know, in class, when you get in there, you attack that class. When you get in there, in that class, you, you know, wads now, or all of this, you attack it. Mm. And in that concept, I, I've integrated that from my lifting. When you get in there, you attack that bar. You know, the bar only moves because you hold on to it. Mm. The weight only goes to where you want it to go. It's, um, it sounds aggressive. But, <laughs> no, but it's, um, but I, I understand it though. But like, <clears throat> excuse me. It sounds aggressive. Yeah. But it's that aggression that like, um, that pushes you to become better. To become better. Yeah. So that's, that's, I guess it's, I guess it's, it's all life lessons. Right? Do you do many group classes at the moment? <laughs> Uh, I, I still do some those ones and they, there's still people in there <laughs> they're, they're all, those people always exist yeah those people yeah. always exist yeah I can yeah. understand in any group fitness class you always have people that come from yeah um, for sure for yeah sure. but I think probably one of the biggest things about it is that it's never about you yeah like sometimes that you feel like they're bringing like a negative energy mm. but it's never about you it's about what they're going through or their yeah. day or their job or their family or there's, exactly, there's, exactly. A whole, there's a whole lot of different there's ways. a whole lot of message but that's the cool thing about being in a room filled of you know you just want to come in you want to get the workout done and you feel so much better afterwards 100%. whatever you're going through you know mm. so I guess for me as a trainer that is my job is to make sure that they leave feeling that way fulfilled yeah, yeah like they've satisfied yeah they've succeeded in something like one of the best feelings is like watching people push themselves on the floor yeah. and you support them and you watch them push through something that's really hard for them or, yeah. or if they're regulars you know what weight they're normally comfortable at yeah. you see them like step it up a notch and struggle Yeah, but yeah, you know sure. and they know at the end of the session when they go home they feel like they've accomplished something Yeah, you know yeah. and I think in today's life um, because everything is um, so sedentary like you know, a lot of stuff is um, is quite still yeah um, yeah but if you can do something real physical that's really out there that pushes you past your comfort zones, it yeah. makes you feel better about yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You talked to me before about never being comfortable. Yes. Um, what do you find? <laughs> what do you find? What do you find at the moment? What challenges you at the moment? What challenges yeah. me at the moment? Well, <laughs> right. Funny you ask, Mike. Right. But um, at the moment, I'm taking on a new sport. <laughs> two okay. new sports ish. Two new sports. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, started uh, at the beginning of the year so like I said I, um, I've given you know powerlifting rest and then weightlifting as well so I've transitioned over to doing CrossFit and why did you decide to give them a rest um, I feel like I've I've done what I wanted okay. with it. Okay. Um, I used my platform as much as I could as well right. in, in that sense. And then, like I, like I said, I'm, I'm always, I just want to, you know, keep changing, keep challenging myself and doing something different. So um, that, so I've moved on to something different and that is CrossFit, obviously. Right. Um, and then that sense is why it helps me with my work. You know, being a police officer, you're running around, you're being active. Um, two and two together, it really helps. So CrossFit. The other one is rugby. Okay. <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Those those two. Have- Firstly, what's what's hard about the CrossFit? What do you find challenging? Because I think coming from a, um, from a, a lifting background, yes, yes. you'd have the natural base mm. for a lot of the lifts and know all the technicals really well. Um, so I think you'd, I, I naturally think that you'd fit straight into it. Yeah. But yeah. you you find you're finding it hard. Yes. What well, do you find hard about it? Um, with CrossFit, obviously, it's it's a lot of movements in it. The things that I find hard are the gymnastic gymnastics. movements. Yeah, <laughs> the say. muscle ups, the okay. the you know butterflies, the handstand walks, all okay. of those things. That it's it's skill work that you need to obviously start from scratch and you know make yourself um, known to it and um, just train yourself up for it and stuff. So that that's definitely something that I've I've found um, hard. But um, sure. Yeah, with you, time. Yeah, Ooh. with time. Sure, with time. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've done many comps. Uh, I've done a few, but okay. mostly um, with with um, you know other teams and stuff. So mostly teams. Being comps. in a team. Yeah. But yeah. what's your aspiration to go individual? Individual. Right. Yeah. Just. Right. Give it are a you go. booked into any individual comps? Uh, yes, nationals at the end of the year. Okay. <laughs> so talk to me after that. That's cool, man. <laughs> We're having cool. it. Have you done that? Have you done an individual? Before? Yes, yeah. yes. So I did. I did individuals last year as well, and um, it was good. So I was. I at, only did this it. This is nationals. Yeah, nationals. So yeah. I only did it in intermediate. So the highest level is RX. So sure. there's you know beginners, scaled, intermediate, and then obviously RX. So this year we're gonna we're gonna go for it and get in there and just you know. Um, so your lifting's okay with it. <laughs> yeah, lifting's okay. Lifting's okay. Yeah, lifting's um, I fine. I imagine that like when it does come time to lifting though, like yeah. um, cuz I know you and you have quite a good cardiac mm. um cardio ability. Mm. Like when it comes to the lifting, you'd be one of the heavier lifters. Yes, yeah. for sure. Okay. Um yeah, I've I've always had love for lifting heavy and all of that. So once once I, you know, want, if there's a wad in it, I'm going, I'm going to own this. Because I know I'm shit at that. I know I'm shit at that. But this time, I'm going to own this shit. Like, this is where I belong. This is what I'm good for. Sure. So, um, yeah. So, definitely with the heavy lifting, I go in there with that mindset. Um, with, you know, with another thing that I find hard is trying to incorporate that mindset with all the other wads or uh, sure. the other exercises Especially as well. when there's the gymnastic component yeah, that you're yeah, not like, so used to. I go in and I'm like, oh my God, I'm scared. I don't know what number we're going to, you know, it'll be like do as many as you can we're going for one you know whereas with, with the lifting do as many as you can we're going for the top number that's going to get me yeah. to win this wad yeah. <laughs> you know so yeah. um, learning that I guess sharing that you know having the same mindset for this wad so with the same mindset with the wad that I'm obviously shit at um, is, is something that I, I'm definitely finding hard or I'm learning to do more yeah. and more as well so I guess with, with that coming from um I think you'll go far. I think I, I think you'll do really, really well. <laughs> no, because I think it's harder to come from the other end of the scope. Like I think it's harder. I think <laughs> listen to me, like as if I know. But no, but I, I think that like it's probably harder to come from like a um, like if you're a gymnast coming yeah. into like the lifting aspect, because mm-hmm. if you haven't got the technique and that stuff and you haven't been doing it for years, mm-hmm. you're more susceptible and more likely to injure yourself. Yeah. Or um, or when you this, this is what I think mm-hmm. when you fatigue. And when you're doing a comp, you are yeah. gonna fatigue. But when you're fat- when you fatigue underneath the bar, it's so much more dangerous mm. than fatiguing during something that's um, got body weight. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. So I think I think you'll do really well. Yeah. Fingers crossed. What what? We'll <laughs> I'll hit you up we'll after the national. I got faith. I got you got faith. faith. Let's go. I do. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll do really well. So it'll be good. It'll, like I said, it'll be a good challenge for me. It's just um, finding that routine. Um, you know, with work and shift work, it's all over the place. Um, and rest. So it's, you know, but um, hopefully in a couple of months I'll, I'll fit into a role where you know I can have a. a a more sustained routine, I guess, so that I can get my um, training done. What's your what's your like? What's your shift work like? What hours is it? Oh, um, so right now I'm part of the community's team, so my shift work is all over the place. I just don't do night shifts. So okay. one week I only work two early, so that's seven to four, and right. then the following week I'll have four days where three on, two off, two on early okay. so, and then the following week it'll be six days on 12 o'clock till 10 o'clock and then, yeah so it's does that mess up your sleeping yes yeah, okay. sleeping training oh it's it's everything but um luckily i love my job and mm. i i still do it but you know in, in that sense imagine what you know um 
what you could the, do if you were resting re, yeah exactly if you were a full time athlete but also in that sense you know I, as much as I would say oh you know it's hard for me Fee and Charmaine did it you know with having a, a full time job like this and they had to train as well and work and especially with a a team sport they had no choice I had the choice where I could train in the morning when my I had night sh- late shift or I could do it at night when I had morning shift whereas they they couldn't you know their teams are required every every certain day and if they're not there they have to sort that out you know so I can't talk <laughs> you know but in sense of you know things like that I'm always like, saying you know if, if this is hard for me imagine what somebody else is going through so you just suck it up and Keep going. I like your mindset. It's so true. <laughs> some people have like one leg. Some people have one arm. Some exactly. people can't do half the physical abilities that we can do. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Shout out to Alva, man. Like, I think. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just not happening for yeah. me today. It's me. I'm bad. <laughs> I'll do this. <laughs> oh, it's always a cold. Yeah, I saw some of the weight that Alvin was throwing around. Oh, no, he's, like, he's a beast, yeah. So my God. We'll just wait. That, and all of that is natural, you know, for him. And he'll come back and just pick it up straight away. Because yeah. so. he's a big dude, but I've seen him do ring muscle ups. No, yeah. I know. That's what makes me think that, like, um, oh, I don't know. You know, I want to say it anyway. <laughs> I watched, you, you ever watch the CrossFit Games? Yes. You ever wonder why there's not many more colored athletes on there? <laughs> I wonder. I, like, I wonder. You know, like I wonder sometimes, like because, because I think of people like Alvin, yeah, and people like yourself, and a lot of Pacific Island. Um, if there's a lot of Pacific Island, there's a lot of African American. There's a lot of other races that are really good at what they do. Yeah, a lot of it might come down to like you know we're talking about self funding. Yeah, and yeah, having to like sure. you know that might be one of the, one of the issues as well. But I've always wondered that yeah. you know like why there aren't even more colored people in it. Yeah. I don't know whether that's a PC thing to say or not, but it's always been like my um, observation of it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I understand there's some great, great, amazing athletes in it. Yeah, yeah. I just think there could be some better ones that are hiding. Yeah, you know. could be hiding out yeah. there. They just need a, yeah. But um, no, we, we've got one um, going through. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of her. Um, her name is, oh my God, she's just, Madeline. Have no. you, do you follow Madeline? No. Mads, my no. girl Mads, hopefully too. <laughs> but um, no, Where's she's, she she's, uh, she's, she's Maori. Right. Yeah, so. She's up here in Auckland? Maori Pakia. Yeah, she, well, right. she was from Auckland and now she's moved down to Christchurch. Okay. To give this a go, give it all and do it full time. Uh, so she's with um, 6-4 um, Fitness. Okay. Um, obviously that's a, you know, CrossFit um, um Program and, yeah, and, everything. and what's her aim to go to the games yeah she right. wants to go to the games and right now she's she's got a good chance um, right so obviously because we um, did have that Kiwi girl that Balangi girl from who down south south what's her name oh uh, Balangi girl, for real. For real? <laughs> it really is a, a New Zealand white girl. Yeah, yeah. And I think she came like third or fourth. Oh, wow. In the last games. Yeah, I don't know. But she's always been in that um, ranking. Yeah, yeah. Are we talking about Jamie Green? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, but she doesn't stay in New Zealand. Oh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so she doesn't stay she's in New Zealand. She's based in America. She's from New Zealand. Uh, I'm not sure where she's based. See, we need to do our research, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you need to get some garage crossfitters. Research, yeah, man. you need to get some crossfitters in here. They will be good gossip people to talk to you about that content. I bet, I bet. And that's well, will be. It's what? a whole world. It's a whole yeah. world, right? Yeah, whole, for uh, sure, for sure. And I got and nothing I, but respect for it. No, for sure. Oh, these these athletes are insane, out of this world, like just incredible. And you know, um, and that's you know they've inspired me to be part of this mm. so um yeah so like i said my girl mads um i follow her right now she's currently going through the opens for you know crossfit that's so the online yeah so that's yeah. the online competition so hopefully well good news well you know um so apparently the i think the big comp will be in australia for you know how they have the pacific region right. everybody compete and then obviously the top will go for um, right. the crossfit games and um she, she's looking good so um she'll be a good good you know if you're into crossfit um she's one to follow um very very down-to-earth girl um just you know um funny quirky you know um i did a comp with her so for those that were like oh do you even know her <laughs> <laughs> I've done a couple of she's one of my good friends so I'm you not just me, saying this for the up, <laughs> I'm not just saying this for the sake of it she, she's a real deal so um, no like I said you know a lot of CrossFit girls out there or 
don't know who to follow mm. just you know our own girls here you don't have to follow the you know just the ones that are top of the games just start helping out with the you know for someone like yourself that's been in like the fitness game for like the last sort of 15 years mm. right do you find it like in the last even five years just the last five years like more Upper Pacific Island people coming through into like the like CrossFit gyms and functional mm. fitness gyms than used to be before. Yeah, for sure. So much more now, eh? So much more. Mm. It's awesome to see. I love it. It's amazing. You yeah. know, they've they've created this amazing community in the CrossFit world. Um, you know, I was with um, Empire Box, so mm. they are um, Lama and Stacy. They they're awesome. They are creating an amazing community there as well. Um, it's you know where families are literally going together, mom, dad, and their kids working out all together and you know for some people they'll say oh isn't it dangerous or so on you know parents are there and the coaches are there and their job is to um make sure that it's safe for the kids so obviously they change some exercises to cater to the kids and um and, mm. and it's awesome to have that you know your kids follow you you know with parents and older brothers and sisters take them there because they, they just want to be like you they they see you know what? Take them because they are your biggest fan. You know, with it's so, true. <laughs> so they'll they'll love you. They look at you like, oh my god, you're this amazing, you know, big brother, big sister, or mom and dad. And mm. if you're doing it, I can do it too. So um, no big ups to you know, like I said, Empire Family, and obviously with um, Alvin doing it at the hybrid is this amazing community. And when you go to comps, you can hear them. I bet they are the loudest supporters. Yeah. You know, and that that's what you love, and mm. that's what gives you that extra one percent to keep going you know when when you're just on the floor you don't want to you know you're 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 done like you said you you know you can't break through that that barrier of oh i can't do any more i can't do one more and then you can hear your supporters on the side like yes you can you know cheering on for you they're there for you mm. and then once you take that on and you you just keep going carry on do you know what's also really cool as well it's what? like um when a lot of our Pacific Island people start coming to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. And they might not have been necessarily too like um, unfit in the past, yeah. but like after like um, like a few months of going to the gym and stuff, they start to realize that they can actually push much harder and faster than other regulars in the gym. And they start to like notice they actually have a talent for some of this stuff. Yeah. And then they just go beyond yeah. and they accelerate and you're watching it as, as a coach. You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. You're watching it and you're just like, oh my God. Like, yeah. And this person is amazed of themselves because they never knew they had this. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. You know, like, and you might not have necessarily seen it as a coach in them, but it's amazing to see. But that's like the raw talent that our Pacific people bring mm -hmm. to the table, you yeah, know? And once yeah. it's, the layers start to come off, yeah. they start to like realize what they're fully capable of. For sure. It's, it's for almost sure. scary. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it, for sure. Um, I th one one example, I can think of an example of that is um, one of my, um, you know, I, I trade with a lot of strong girls. So like I said, Carlina is taking on the top class and another one is Jewel. So her name is Jewel Tassi. She's, okay. um, I see her as, you know, like a little sister. She, she's young. So when she first started, she was, you know, it was just a, a thing that she just wanted to do and she didn't know how strong she was. But we, we knew, you know, we could see from the outside. The she wasn't even trying. Power. She wasn't even trying and she was, you know, um, squatting 200 deadlifting you know 210 so, and you're just like and what? she's just there like am I done you know like that just that uh, effortless yeah it's effortless and just that raw strength that raw strength that it's and you're just like you're not done and, yeah. and then she's like oh are you sure like you know and she's just so you know just that Oh, it, quite it's innocent about it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like you said you know that humility and that humbleness that comes with being you know the, all the Pacific Islanders that um, you know you, you get on um, I see a lot with the young rugby players as well being in that you know community now um, you know they finish school and so they love it so they're doing it and then you just see the talent there and you're just like man in five six ten years time you're uh, you're the you're going to be the next yeah. blackbird you know you're yeah. the next champion of what you're doing and stuff and it's all there and it's all out of talent you know so uh, you know if, if that's what if that's where you are with talent imagine everything else that comes with it mm -hmm. discipline commitment if it's harnessed push. if it's focused yeah yeah, yeah it's going to get you that much further so um, it's it's all there you know I always every time you know somebody comes in the gym or I see somebody doing something um, that's 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 the vision that I want them to f see or feel even feel when they leave the gym mm -hmm. you know it's like they come in and they're kind of like oh scared to try something and then I'm like I, I hype them up 
I'm that hype girl. I'm like, you got this. They're like, no, 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 you, no, you've got to say it. Look at the mirror and you say you got this. You ain't no punk bitch. You got this. And like, no, and it, it starts wearing off. Like, oh, actually, no, no, yeah. When you get out there, it's just you and that bar or you and that boy and you and that person that you're trying to take down. And nobody else can tell you otherwise. You take that person down. You fight for it. If you want it, you will get it. That's and right. they're just like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, and you are great at it. Yeah, you own what you've got, you know? Each each to their own, and we all have our special talents and our gifts, but you have a gift. And I want to make sure that whoever I pass with understands that you have a gift. It may not be what I see, or it may not be what everybody else around you see, but you've got a gift, and you have a job to share it and, mm. you know, and, and use it, you know? So when I see people and I see that talent, I go up to them, and I'm like, girl, you got this. Mm. You, oh my God, two, three years time, give it time, you will be the best at what you got. And, you know, so um, I think that's a lot of things that um, a lot of our, you know, Pacific Islander people lack is that confidence in themselves. You know, it's the, oh, I don't know if I can or like. That's why I was asking you where you get it from. Oh. It's, it's such a, no, but it's so true. It's, it's so common. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's, um, sometimes it's frustrating as well. Because like how we were talking before about people that have like raw talent, mm -hmm. raw strength. And you want to guide them, you want them to do better, mm. but they don't have it within themselves to like take the next step because yeah. they don't believe yeah. that much in themselves. You know what I mean? And maybe they need that extra push or that extra encouragement just to make that that next step in it. Yeah. Because yeah, a lot of our people like lack that self belief, that yes. um, that self confidence. Ooh, doesn't it irritate you though? It does. It does. <laughs> no, no, it does. Because I always feel like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yeah. You know no. What I mean? You can encourage. You can encourage someone as far as you can. Yeah. And push yeah. them as. as but until they until they love themselves yeah they yeah. can't like take that extra step forward for themselves for sure um, for sure and it's it's common yeah. but um, I just hope that more and more people listen to this or more and more people are encouraged by what you do because yeah, yeah. that's a massive part of who you are yeah for sure it's driving people forward yeah yeah for sure um Oh, I just went mind blank. It's all good. <laughs> talk to me. Talk to me about the rugby journey. The rugby journey. Yeah. Oh my god. So, um, so Charmaine Smith reached out to me um, on Instagram. Mm. So we followed each other, and she was like, "Hey, um, I think you'll be great at rugby. You should come give it a go." And I'm like, "Oh my god." <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of perfect timing because I was kind of ready to, like I said, you know, um, put put aside my lifting and try something new. Yeah. So I was like, okay, um, yeah, it's it's the time for it. Might as well give it a go. You know, I'm not, and I told her, I was like, I'm not that great at it, honestly. You tried but, it before. Yeah, I did try it before. Before, so it was the first time that I picked up my lifting. So yes. I tried it before, and then I got injured. Okay. and it kind of held me back with my lifting right. and then I had a conversation with my coach I was saying hey what do you think I should do I you know I want to invest in something and I'm going to give it four years four or five years and my coach was saying well I mean rugby will always be there you can you know you can go do that or and then you're going to get injured if you don't know your body wild enough or you can get stronger and then go back to it so I was thinking oh okay that's smart you know um learn all the lifting and all of that get strong get fit and if it's still if it's something that's still there that i want to do and it'll come up again i'll give it a go so i dropped the rugby and then i picked up powerlifting so that was my powerlifting journey and then when i finished my powerlifting journey it came up did you have a passion for rugby when you first started playing rugby i never played rugby when i first picked it up oh, you're just so training. maris college we never had a rugby team so it wasn't yeah i just, okay. i was just training i okay. just i just and my my biggest thing is i am very open-minded with things you know you've got to go you, you've got to try and go into things like that that you don't know because if you don't it's it's hard and it, it's draining and mm. you know you, you don't want to do things that's hard and draining because it, your energy just goes down so i i never pl i've never played rugby so when i picked that up i was going okay again with my i'm i'm gonna be shit at it but give me time and i will be good at it you know um and with every sport that i would pick up i always looked at the what's the highest level that i can get and that is my goal you know, so with my powerlifting, I, I spoke to my coach. I was like, how long does it take for me to be the best that I can be? He goes, give it four or five years. And then from then on, we'll reevaluate if you want to keep going. I said, okay, I'm going to invest four years or so. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very, you know. And so I invested in four years. And like I said, I did the best that I could. 
in that perspective and then I wanted to move forward so and or try something else and then that's where rugby came in mm. and um, yeah so like I said my, my mate Charmaine Smith she reached out to me and was like hey you want to give this a go and I was like oh I'm not the great at it but hey I'll give it a go the fact that you believe in me I'm gonna give it a go <laughs> you know you haven't seen me but you've seen my stories let's go you know anything I'll go for it so um, she invited me over did some sessions with her and obviously their team and everything and um, I loved it but you right. know what I loved what do you love that Don't I was it? so shit at it Okay. I loved that I was so shit at it. What were you so shit at? I was sh- I couldn't Which pass part? the ball. I couldn't okay. catch the ball. I just knew how to run and I was fit enough. I could tackle because of the job that I... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the tackle, you know, you're going to chase people, you're going to take them down. But I was just so shit at it that I was like... How did you feel? Stiff? Well, the transition from being the you know best that you can at, at a, yeah. and performing at a top level yeah. internationally to well, it's different because like probably the people that you're training with and playing rugby with, they've been doing it for like maybe the last ten years. Yeah, I know, but see, that doesn't go in my head. That I'm like, no, I don't care. Just because they've done it for five years doesn't mean you know, be, you know. Well, this is a conversation that I have with my friends, and obviously, I'm like, no, no, that that's that's an excuse. In my head, I'm that's like, an that's excuse. an excuse. I don't want to hear that. Even though they have muscle memory and they do yeah. things, but <laughs> that's, an, that's excuse. an excuse. You know, because okay. in my head, I, you know, I try and understand. You have high expectations of yourself. Yes, yeah. yes, you know. And so I'm just like, anybody's beatable. Anybody is beatable. So, you know, when I was at the top and, you know, somebody else came and took it over me, I was beatable and I just, I was ready to move on to something else. So whoever's at the top of their game, I'm ready to take them down. Big challenge, but, <laughs> but you know, and, and that, I wasn't saying as in person, but I was just pushing myself yeah, yeah, yeah. try and create these things where okay. in my head I'm like I can do this if they can I can as well you know even if it'll take me you know years or whatever and if it requires me to do all of this I can too and I think it's because of learning from you know doing another lifting sport that it required me over a longer period of time that I'm going okay this may take some time but I will be the best at what I'm trying to do when did your rugby journey begin <laughs> Uh, last well, I, I wouldn't think COVID last year. I tried last year, but okay. there wasn't really much for last year because yeah. um, yeah, obviously there was a lockdown. So this year, okay. this year, yeah, it'll probably be this year. So Have you played a game yet? Yes, we, I've had a few. Pre- had a <laughs> if few you want to laugh, no, come, no, no. come this Saturday. We, we've got a game this Saturday. Stupid enough to laugh at you, <laughs> We've got a game this Saturday. So I play for Rifles College Rifles. Big shout out to the girls there. Uh, we've got our first game with. Rewa. So it will be a good game, good game, um, good tough game. Um, it's at College Rifles, 2.45 this Saturday. Tomorrow? What position do you play? <laughs> I'm a winger. Okay. So <laughs> that <laughs> you fast? You're fast. I, I, I know I'm fast and I know I'm fit. So when I went into this, I, I told them, I was like, I'm, fa- I'm fast, I'm fit. I'm just not that great at everything else, but I am willing to learn. Mm. I am willing to learn and do whatever it takes to obviously you know be good at this and that you just need to tell me what i need to do and i'll do it so they they just gave you know gave me that opportunity and i was lucky enough to have coaches that see something or maybe are forced to see Mm. something in me and um, are giving me that chance to play so that's cool that's great yeah do you find it quite a um, difference from obviously lifting's almost it's not um you're not doing it alone because you've got your coaches and stuff yeah. but it's quite a it's a very different sport yeah, where you're just yeah. pretty basically depending on yourself yeah, and, what, yeah. and your training and everything yeah. to going to working in a team mm. um, how do you find that oh it's a relief you sharing something or no no a, no ah, the well, opposite because yeah well uh, so you're the one yelling at everyone else uh, <laughs> I can't see because I know I'm not good at it I can't so okay. I, I I know my place I guess but in that sense you know I from coming from an independent uh, you know yeah. sport where individual high expectations high expectation you're on your own when, when you train you train you mm. get the, get it done and then when you go to a sport where it's a team sport I can't play a game without the other girls I can't win or I can't score I can't can't without the other girls so you know my biggest thing is you're only as fast as your slowest person you're only as strong as your weakest person so if I'm coming in there with all these knowledge and all of this understanding and you know I I can be fit I can be all of that can be tall so I've come in this sport going if anybody needs help I'll take you for a run I'll take you through this I'll do this in exchange you want to help me with my ball skills (laughs) so you know 
so that in that sense it, and it's also cool to 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 belong in a group where you're all feeling the same you mm. know and as an um, individual um, you know athlete going into on a platform it's a stage the lights are on you everything's on you mm. and you're lifting this weight all on your own nobody else Sorry. all on your own so everything is all on your own you know you get knocked out you, get knocked well. out. you, you are the person that's going to pick yourself up so having from that to a team when you get knocked down your teammates there you know they're, they're that you feed off each other um and i guess that that having that is is amazing mm. and um you know for i always tell the girls that are in sports they have never played by themselves it's it's that's a nice feeling that's such a privilege to have that to have your girls around you because coming from a sport where it was just me myself i, I had nobody even though your coaches were there mm. on the day yeah. it's just you yeah. it's just you the bar and everybody else around you so you've got to zone in and you know so I guess that transition was, it was it was a good feeling. I loved it, but also the you know I was always competitive with myself. I was always going, okay, if the girls are training this, then I've got to work twice as hard because these girls have done it for three years. So if you know if they're training this time, I got to come in extras and do extras and you know do extra stuff that I'm bad at or that I'm shit at. I can't be doing the stuff that I'm good at because I'm already good at that. I've got to work on the, the stuff that I'm, you know, not that good at. And I also see it as a responsibility to my team. If I don't work on myself and I don't get any better, yeah. that's a reflection to how my team is going to look yeah. out there on the field, you know. So, um, and I guess I try and incorporate that or, you know, try and get that to the girls around me that are, you know, may not be keen to do things and I'm like I need you just as much as you need me you know there'll be girls that are like oh my god you're so fit and I'm like yeah but if I'm running and I need backup I need you there so I, I, yeah I can be the fittest person but if you're not fit with me I'm I'm useless on my own That's you right. know so yeah. I can't I can't take the, you know like I, I'll get the ball and I'll go in and if you're not with me what's the point of me having it because you're not going to be with me mm. so in that sense they kind of get like oh oh okay so I, I'm lucky enough to have that understanding where I can I guess transfer that knowledge to them and be like honestly if you want a great team every individual needs to be thinking that they're individual players mm -hmm. because then when you have 15 individual players that are thinking like that you put them on it's like they've just taken it to the next level mm -hmm. you know and it's it's also a sense of you're a family, you're a sisterhood, and you hold yourself accountable and you hold each other accountable and not take anything to heart. You know, it's like, you know, like this week, oh yeah, everybody was good. And then next week, somebody doesn't show up, call them out for it. Yeah. Like, why did you come to training? Because you didn't come to training. We lost, you know, we didn't get the numbers. So therefore, we didn't understand this. And now that you've missed out this week, now we've got to go back. And now we're a step back when we should be a step forward with our, you know, everything. So I think it's that it's that sense of maturity to be able to talk and say you know what yeah you you effed up mm. and then we paid for it mm. so holding each other accountable yeah yeah very important so that's that's i think that's the biggest thing that i've learned from having that transition to holding myself accountable to hold each other accountable and have that you know and then you come across some people in rugby especially here in new zealand mm. that are just freakishly good by themselves oh my God. That just get I the know. ball and they're just unstoppable. <laughs> you know, mate. That does exist. That does exist. Yeah. Well. I love no. what you say about the, the team. Com the team, because um, teamwork is so important. Yeah. And yeah. I think every team should think like that. But then yeah. every now and then in New Zealand, you come across some people that are just insane. I remember someone told me that used to um, grow up with Jonah. Yeah. They played uh. against Jonah and said, whenever Jonah would get the ball, we wouldn't run towards it, we'd all just aim for the back flag. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully one of us would get we'll there get, and try yeah. and hold on to a leg or something. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's how insane he was. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine in women's rugby as well, there's um, there yeah. there'd be women that just slice through lines. Yeah, there's so many. Yeah. And, and like I said, but yeah. if we put in that concept- You might be the next one. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll hold you to Hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> But uh, no, I definitely see that within, you know, like um, in, in the sporting arena of all these girls and um, it's just insane. And it's it's funny you say that just, you know, because it's a it's a sport that it's in rugby, but that concept comes across in CrossFit, you know, when there's, it's at nationals, everybody has the same one. And as soon as the timer goes, 
you can see who is unstoppable and is just smashing through it. Works That's well one of the team. Exactly, yeah, and yeah. T- just like the team, if you know, as soon as the game's on, yep, as soon as you pass, you know who to pass it to, and that person will just break through the line. And your job now is to support, as in you know exactly where to be because you know your player so well, you know. And like with those talented players, oh, they're only as it's great as the supportive yeah. people behind. You know, like the team is only great as of each other and using utilizing each other and stuff so imagine if we could get all these girls just fit and crazy and amazing all the talents oh well the black women are pretty unstoppable yes right? yes they are mm. they are the champs yeah. <laughs> crazy so. team. i think they've done more world cups in the world than the all blacks yeah is that right yeah yeah but not many people know about that right 100 <laughs> Hundred percent. That's my point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. Definitely. Hey, something I didn't ask you before about when you were lifting. Mm. Um, when you're lifting, because you're lifting by um, by class, is that right? By weight class. Yes. Right. Do you have to get? Is it is this is it like fighting where you have to get down and you have a weigh in for your weight? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you, it's all class, obviously. Um, so category. So. Um, there'll be you have to be that certain weight so if you're over that weight you have to go to the other weight class so, mm. so when are you weighed in are you weighed in the day before you lift on the day the day of the your day lift. of the lift so that yeah that's I guess another thing that I don't miss but um, yeah yeah so a lot of people you know with a lot of athletes I with myself I used to cut a lot of weight because I love my food <laughs> I played myself I joined I wanted to be fit but it was because I love my what food your, so much what was your weight class so my weight class was 72s okay so we, you had to be 71.9 if anything more than 72 you were the next class up which is 84 so you're competing against girls that are cutting from 86 kgs down to 84 so they you know their strength is just what what are you normally at around when you're walking? So around? I sit when around seventy nine, seventy nine, eighty. So you're cutting like eight kilos. Yep, and comps usually, you know, we start our routine uh, eight weeks away, ten weeks, twelve weeks away. So that's when you start cutting and everything. Well, I'm supposed to be always on weight, but hee hee, hate you too. <laughs> Love my tower and cold beef too much, but um, yeah. So in that sense as well, that's that's a lot to take. If you cut weight, do you lose power? Do you well, strength? yes, you do. yes, you do because you know you're not eating as much as well. So, with in regards to weight class, you weigh in mm. two hours later, you warm up and you max out. So, I I had to do a lot of water cuts. So, oh my gosh, uh, I was about, just about to ask you. I that, had like, to do a lot of water it cuts. Must be rough if you're dehydrated. For yep. It. So the the process that went after, like, so you weigh in, and this was you know weigh in, and then after that. You just had to eat, yeah, drink heaps of water, like three liters in two hours. But drink, you know, what goes in must come out. So you're drinking and then you weigh it uh, and then you're trying to warm up, go to the toilet and then get ready for your heavy lifts. You're maxing out. This is not just a, oh, we'll see what you can lift. You're maxing out because you're competing against everybody else in the weight class. So it's quite intense, you know, Um, but, you know. You do it because of the love of the sport and the competitiveness and, you know, you want to push through and push through your limits and see what your body is capable of. Were you ever worried about not making weight? Haha, <laughs> all the time. All the time. <laughs> I, I was never on weight until the day that I had to weigh in. What's the roughest cut you had to make really fast? Oh, oh my God. I think it was probably like one of my big comp, but yeah. Like, I think I was like five days out and I was still I have like, memories of seeing you post something when you're in Canada yes arriving in Canada being on a treadmill <laughs> and eating broccoli yeah <laughs> is this right yeah. this is a long time ago a long time but yes yes you know and, and you know people don't take into consideration the flying and yeah so you have to go up at least a week earlier so that your body can get used to time the time changes and if you think all of that is it goes adjustment into it. yeah adjustment to it takes up space in your mind as yes, well like so, you think it's just you see someone on a platform lifting yeah but everything else that they're going through like yeah, from their weight yeah. cut to adjusting as well yeah yeah plays a massive part on their mind and they're yeah, also probably yeah. over there away from their families yeah um, there's all that stuff everything is going through your head everything and imagine doing this by yourself mm. um, so 
with me, uh, every time I would go away for a comp or I'm preparing for a comp, I would like to read books, read books mm-hmm. around. So I knew I knew I was physically strong enough, you know, at a young, um, obviously when I started, I knew I was physically physically strong, but I, I needed to, um, you know, work on my mental game. Mm. So that was the deal breaker for me was right. my mental game. I knew, and especially being such a young, at a young age into a sport where I was competing against girls that... Um, were over 20, 25 plus, and they were peaking at that age. So these are females that, on an international level, they've done heaps of comps like this. So this is a breeze, like, you know, not a breeze, but it's it's a lot more, I you know, they're it. a lot more comfortable with it. Yeah, used to it, whereas I'm like, oh my God, so I'm there fangirling everybody, but at the right. same time trying to, you know, like I got this, tomorrow's the day, and I'm competing against the best of the best. So in that sense, I, I, I had to think about the process and say okay what will help me what will help me overcome these fears these doubts these because I, I still you know like I said back then I had doubts on myself mm. um, and it was reading reading was my go-to um, you know a lot of centers you calms yeah, you a lot of um, and I I didn't just read any books I read books around mental game I read the CrossFit games one with um, Ka- um, Katrina um, and then I read the the energy bus have you heard of the energy bus no, oh you have to read it you'll love it okay. the energy bus um, just just books around preparing for obviously a big comp you're so good to talk to yeah <laughs> just you like are. to blab about everything <laughs> I know but you have um, you have quite an important drive yeah. about you you know that I think is really important for people to hear about mm. um Man, you're, you're such a high achiever as well. And it's because of your mindset and the way you think about things. I can tell. Yeah. I can tell. You have quite an aggressive push yeah, and everything. Yeah. Do you ever go through like low patches? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, no, definitely. I've, I've had my downfall. Um, I still do. Because you know? you're human. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Because of that too. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, like... Um, you know, I have days, um, and I guess with the job that I have, um, I'm quite, how do you say, I invest in a lot, you know, in, in the person and, and people. So when I go to a job, I that's me. I've emotionally, you know, they tell us not to, you know, in the job. Yeah, they, I was about they to tell say that. us think, not to. But that's a thing over time that over you learn time. to separate yourself from yeah, situations yeah. that you come across. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But I. For me personally, I find that it's it's helped me get through to people though. I because of me being atta- not attached but emotionally investing invest in, in this job that people see the realness in me when I talk. So you know you have people where they come in and they're like yeah, yeah yeah anyways we gotta go let's just fix this and, and leave. And then for myself I'm like are you okay? Is this what you want? You know and you know and it's it, when that comes across people start going and then they start opening up and then we get to the you know deeper things to it so I guess because I've done that it's almost like oh my god and then I go home and I'm like oh I feel that I you carry I feel, it yeah with me. <laughs> you know I'm like oh what about that family I hope that they're okay or I hope that you know they've you know everything's okay and they you know and like I said with friends and everything it, it's a big, it's become something that I've just you know so but um with low points oh man i've i've had my fair share as well um you know like i keep taking it back to losing my parents you right. know after them even though they've been that huge drive i i had my fair share off why 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 them why did that have to be taken away um it's not fair, I, it's not fair. I don't want to be here anymore i don't want to be in this earth without them they were like you know with everything that i they were the reason why I came over, you know. So, and, and with myself, I'm like, if God had a plan, why did I come over? Why didn't I just stay back in the islands a little longer to spend more time with them, you know? Just things like that. So, but you know, there there is a plan, and I've just got to have faith that you know, just keep going through. But I've definitely had my fair share of, you know, downs, and obviously, you know, not going to a comp as well, and then you know losing and being like oh but I I did so hard and you know I invested so much and I gave up this you know this amount of time for it and all of that so yeah we all go through it you know but um one thing that I've I've always 
I tell people is, you know, tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow is a, another opportunity to yeah. start again, to try again. Uh, my biggest thing, you know, that I always tell my sister is try again the tomorrow. Today may not be a good day. We'll try again tomorrow, you know. And then tomorrow's not a good day. We'll try again tomorrow. Lucky there's heaps of days. <laughs> there's 365 <laughs> days of the year. So if one goes bad, tomorrow's a new day. Start right. again. Start again. Have you always found it quite easy to bounce back from things? Or is it... Has it been like a process for you over the years to like to try and better those darker thoughts in your mind? Um, definitely a process. Yeah. Um, I've had to teach myself. Yeah. I've had to read about it, and then um, yeah, like I said, I've I've used that concept of I read about it, like you know, based on a true story, and I'm like, oh well, if this person can get through this, then I can too. You know, they've gone through their hardest, you know, trials and all of that, so I I can get through too. So. Um, I've always had this hope in me, you know. Um, I've always been the one percent that for others as well, you know. When nobody believes in you, I'm that one percent that believes in you. So I've incorporated it in myself, and I've incorporated it in others. So therefore, hopefully, people can see that and can do it with, you know. Obviously, continue doing it to themselves and to other people. Do you feel pressure to be a role model? To be that you're seen as a role model? Uh yes. Yes, 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 I, I do. And um, and honestly, I just look at my sister, you know. Um, I didn't choose or I didn't have a choice to be her, you know, that image that she looks up to. I just, I just had to do it. Mm. And because I love her so much that I would do it, you know. So when it, you know, I understand when it comes to people on social media that do these things and then it's like, oh, well, you're a role model now. You've created this platform. They, they didn't choose that. They just created an, an image or something that they love and then people have followed it and then have created this perspective Their own of... expectations of Yeah, you know. So I, I do feel that yeah. for people in that perspective of, you know, role, it's, it's such a big title role model I, I don't see myself as that I just see myself as my little sister's big sister you right. know so if I can whatever I do it's a reflection of if she was to look at me and if she was to be proud of my actions and what I do then I'm okay with that you know um, in regards to everybody else or everybody else that are looking at everybody else's kids um, they've got their own parents they've got their own people that they look up to and you know yes they they follow me or you know so I would do my best but at the end of the day they still have their parents to go back to so mm. you know they they've still got that privilege and they that you know that even though they may not see it they'll be like oh, I don't want to look up to my mom uh, nah, nah, nah. when they come to me and they're like oh no I look up to you don't look up to me look up to your mom and dad you know I, I set them straight I you know so and then in that sense like I said I, I don't put myself as a role model or so I just do what I think is best for me and what I would love for you know my sister to look up to and say okay okay yeah and hopefully you know encourage her and any other young girl out there to follow through so yeah so no, no, no. <laughs> the pressure that comes with it, yes, I understand there's a lot of pressure, yeah. but, um, and I understand the concept of, you know, social media. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm big on social media and, you know, I pick and choose what I put up there. I think a lot of people don't understand that, um, but, you know, family members and close friends do that, you know, the things that I post are the things that I want you to see. And then there's another flip side to it, you know, don't believe what, you see you know it, instagram it's all highlights not everybody wants to broadcast their sad you know lives and all of that and you know so it, it is it is hard but um you know i just do my best and i just look at my little sister and i'm like oh is this something that she'll be proud to see her sister doing and looking up to her sister doing mm. oh yeah I want to say to you something that i've been thinking about this whole conversation yeah. <laughs> i've been waiting right to the end um, <laughs> I think that um, I think that your parents would be very, very proud of you. Oh. I think that I think that your parents would be so proud of you. Um, knowing your story and knowing um, what you've gone through with losing both parents and how much that meant to you. Uh, if you were my daughter yeah. and had sent you away at such a young age, yeah. this is what I would have hoped for 
This is everything that I would have hoped for, what I would have invested in, and what I would have been grateful for my siblings to have raised is what's sitting across the table from me. <laughs> you are, you're a great woman, you're a great woman, Barbara, and yeah. you have um, great ethics and great morals and a great compass that drives you. Mm-hmm. And man, honestly, your parents will look down on you, be so proud of you. And not just that, but the woman that you've become and how you look after your younger sister as well mm. is invaluable. Yeah. So everything that you are, I think that, <laughs> I, think that um, I know that you say you find it quite hard sometimes to be seen as a role model. Mm. Um, but I think that your younger sister has got like such a great example that leads, leads her forward. Yeah. And I don't think you need to feel any pressure about it because you do that quite instinctively, just naturally. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming yeah. to my parish. I'm sorry the camera died like yeah. six times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for finding the right garage. <laughs> to come to after going I'm going to go back and say thanks to the lady someone else's house you're the real MVP <laughs> um, I wish you all the best with your um, your CrossFit I'm so interested to see how you go with this man because oh, I yes. think you got some real punch <laughs> and some real potential yeah and yeah. also with your rugby journey as well and everything else like um, you life know, life being a cop <laughs> Yeah. Um, your own life, everything everything that, that you're going through, yeah. um, all your challenges that will come up and there will be more challenges that come up as sure. is life. Sure. Um, but thank you for coming to the garage and I appreciate having you. Yes. Uh, thank cheers. you, Barbara. Malo. It's in that mic called Mike. It's in that mic called Mike. Yeah. Garage drinks with Mike. <laughs>